Welcome to this tutorial on the normal distribution. The normal distribution is the most common continuous probability distribution used in statistics. The normal distribution is very important statistics mainly because many variables in the business world and life in general follow the normal distribution. The normal distribution can also be used to approximate other discrete probability distributions. The normal distribution looks like this. As you can see, it is bell-shaped and symmetrical. In this diagram, it is shown as a relative frequency histogram. Once we smooth out the bars, we can draw a traditional-looking normal distribution curve that looks like this. Here you can see the curve superimposed on the histogram. For the rest of our discussion of the normal distribution curve, we will only show the curve and not the underlying histogram. Here are several normal distribution curves. As you can see, all these are bell-shaped and symmetrical, but they all look different. What defines a normal distribution curve are two parameters, the mean, mu, and the standard deviation, sigma. For every combination of mu and sigma, a different normal distribution is generated. Another interesting characteristic of the normal distribution is that the highest point on the curve is the mean, which is also the median and the mode of the distribution. Take a look at these different normal distribution curves. Look at the ones that are labeled A and B. They both have the same mean of 50, but which of these two curves, A or B, has a larger standard deviation? Remember, the larger the standard deviation, the more dispersed the data is. Curve A is shorter and fatter, or more spread out. Curve B is taller and skinnier, with data values more closely clustered around the mean. So which curve has more dispersion? Which curve has the higher standard deviation? It would be curve A, since its curve is wider and more spread out. Now let's compare curve B with curve C. These two curves look alike, and they have the same standard deviation. Both are tall and skinny and look like the data is dispersed in the same way. But the mean for curve C is higher than the mean for curve B. The mean for curve B is 50 and the mean for curve C is 90. From this illustration, we can see how important both the mean and the standard deviation is when we describe a set of data. The data can be normally distributed, but the mean and standard deviation is needed to describe how the data looks. To determine the area under the curve for any section of the distribution, we would need to use integral calculus and the computations are tedious. For this reason, we have normal probability tables that help us to avoid these computations. In order to use these tables, we first need to use what is called a transformation formula to convert any random x variable to a standardized z-score, or a z-variable. Here is the transformation formula we will use to convert a given x variable to a standardized z variable. As you can see, the formula is pretty simple. We take x minus mu divided by sigma to get z. Once we do this, we will have a standardized distribution where the mean is always equal to 0 and a standard deviation will always be 1. Let's look at an example of the distribution of grades with a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 3. Let's take a look at the x scores for this grade distribution. The mean is 80, so we can see that it is labeled in the middle of the distribution. Then since the standard deviation is 3, every three points below the mean is labeled 77, 74, and 71. And every three points above the mean is also labeled 83, 86, 89. Okay, so it's minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. Remember when we discussed Chebyshev's theorem and the empirical rule, we said that virtually all the data is contained within three standard deviations of the mean. So we would expect all the grades here to be between a 71 and an 89 for this distribution. Now let's standardize the x scores to z scores. Let's start with the mean of 80. Using the transformation formula, z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma, we get z is equal to 80 minus the mean 80 divided by the standard deviation 3 and we get 0. So you can see from this graph the corresponding z-score for an x of 80 is 0. In fact every measurement of x has a corresponding standardized z-measurement. 
We can see this graphically, but we can use the Z transformation formula to calculate the corresponding scores. Let's take another number, say 77. Using the Z formula, we get 77 minus 80 divided by 3, and that is negative 1. For 74, we would get negative 2, and for 71, using the formula, we would get negative 3. On the right side of the distribution above the mean, we would get Z scores of 1, 2, and 3 for each of the respective X scores of 83, 86, and 89. You can verify this by using the Z transformation formula for each of these numbers. So let's review what we have learned so far about the normal distribution curve. First, it is bell-shaped and symmetrical with the highest point of the distribution equal to the mean. Furthermore, for the normal distribution curve, the mean mu will always be equal to 0 and a standard deviation will always be equal to 1. In addition to these characteristics, the area under the normal distribution curve will always equal 1. And because the distribution is symmetrical with the mean equal to the median, the mean splits the distribution into two parts, with 50% of the distribution above the mean and 50% of the distribution below the mean. So the area under the curve to the left of the mean will always be 0.5, and the area to the right of the mean will also always be 0.5. In an earlier tutorial, we discussed Chebyshev's theorem and the empirical rule, which tells us the areas under the curve that are 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations from the mean. From the empirical rule, we know that approximately 68.3% of the data values are within one standard deviation of the mean, that is plus or minus 1. If we translate that to our X scores for student grades with a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 3 points, then plus 1 standard deviation would be 83, and minus 1 standard deviation would be 77. So what we are saying here is that 68.3% of the student grades will be distributed between a 77 and an 83. Taking this further then, since 95.4% of the distribution is within two standard deviations of the mean, we can say that approximately 95% of the students got between a 74 and an 86. And finally, virtually all the data is contained within three standard deviations of the mean. So for our student example, this means that almost all the students got between a 71 and an 89. Let's say we want to find the probability of a student grade being less than 83. How would we find this probability or this area under the curve? Here you can see the normal probability curve with the area we are interested in shaded in green. This is the area to the left of the x value of 83. 83 is slightly above the mean of 80. It is actually one standard deviation above the mean. Remember, for this example, the mean is 80 and a standard deviation is 3 points. The first step in finding the area under the curve is to convert the x value to a standardized z value using the transformation formula. z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. So let's do it. 83 minus 80 divided by 3 is 1. So we want to find the probability under the curve to the left of 1 in z values. Now we are ready to use the z table to find this value. This is a z table. This table represents the cumulative area under the curve to the left of any z value. The area to the left of 0, the mean, is understood to be 0.5 since the mean splits the distribution in half with 0.5 on one side of the mean and 0.5 on the other side. So we still need to determine the shaded area between 0 and z and then add 0.5 to it. This table does both and gives us the entire area or cumulative area from below a z of 0 to the z value we are looking for. If you take a look at the picture on the right hand side of the distribution, you can see the gray shaded area. The gray shaded area is the probability that the table gives you. The reason I'm showing you this is that there are a few variations of the z table, but every z table has a picture of the distribution next to it or above it. And if you look at the picture and the shaded area, you'll understand which probabilities the table is giving you. In this case, again, the shaded area you can see is the area cumulatively below z. So the z values we are looking for is a z equal 1. Remember, we converted an x value of 83 to a z value of 1. 
To find the cumulative probability for z equal 1, we look at the table value that is located at the intersection of the row labeled 1.0 and the column labeled 0 0.00. The table has the value in the left-hand column for the value right before and after the decimal point, so the ones place and the tenths place is 1.0. And at the top, you see the value for the hundredths place at 0 0.00. So we take the intersection of these two to represent 1.00, and we get 0.8413. So the probability of z less than or equal to 1.0 is 0.8413. And so the probability of an x value less than or equal to 83 is 84.13%. Let's see what the probability is for an x greater than 83. Again, we would convert that x value to a z value as we did previously and get a z value equal to 1.0. But this time we're interested in the area to the right or above that z value. Well, we know that the entire distribution is equal to 100% or 1. And the area to the left of a z value is 0.8. 413. So we get the area to the right of the z value by subtracting the area to the left from the whole, and we get 0.1587. That means that 15.87% of the values are above a z of 1.0, or to put it in x terms, 15.87% of the grades are above an 83. So now we know how to use the z table to determine the values both below and above a given z value. Let's try another variation using the table, and that is to determine the probability that x is between an 83 and an 80. That's the same as saying what is the probability that z is between 0 and 1. There are a number of ways we can figure this out, all of them stemming from our knowledge that the entire distribution is equal to 1, and the mean splits the distribution in half with 0.5 on one side and 0.5 on the other side. Now, we already determined that the probability to the left of an x of 83, or a z of 1, is 0.8413. And the probability below the mean is 0.5. So the difference between 0.8413 and 0.5 would equal the area between 0 and 1, and that is 0.3413. Let's use a different x value to make sure we understand how to find areas under the curve using the z table. Let's take an example of 85. OK, what is the probability of x less than or equal to 85? So the first step is to convert the x score to a z score. Let's do it. 85 minus 80 divided by 3 is 1.666667, or rounded to 1.67. So the corresponding z for an x value of 85 is 1.67. All right, now we need to look up 1.67 in the z table. We look up 1.6 on the left hand and 0.07 at the top. Okay, remember I said that the left hand side is the space before and after the decimal point, and then at the top is the hundred space. So we have 1.67, 1.6 on the left, and 0.07 on the right. And we get 0.9525. So the probability of z being less than or equal to 1.67 is 0.9525, which means the probability of an x value of 85 or less is 0.9525, or 95.25%. Now let's take a look at the negative side of the z distribution, the values below the mean of 0. This table is used for the negative values. Most z tables come with a picture above the table showing the shaded area of the distribution given by the table. This figure shows the area below a negative z is shaded, so any value we look up in this particular table will give us the area below that value. Let's say, for example, we want to know the probability of getting less than a 75 as an x value. So first we have to convert x value 75 into a z value by using the transformation formula x minus mu divided by sigma. So it's 75 minus 80 divided by 3, which is negative 1.67. And that's why we're using the negative table. So now we look up negative 1.67 in the table. First we look up negative 1.6 on the left-hand side and 0.07 at the top. Remember, 
we look at the left hand side of the column for the numbers before and after the decimal place, so the ones and tenths place, and we look at the row above for the hundredths place, so 0.07. Now we look for the intersection of these two numbers by following across the row and down the column, and we get 0 0.0475. So the probability of z less than or equal to negative 1.67 is 0 0.0475. The more you do these exercises, the more familiar you will get with obtaining any area under the curve using either table. Let's try one more scenario. Let's find the probability that x is between 75 and 83. We have already calculated the z values for these x values. An x value of 75 is a z value of negative 1.67. And an x value of 83 is a z value of 1.0. Rewind and review if you miss that. So looking for the probability that x is between 75 and 83 is the same as saying what is the probability that z is between negative 1.67 and 1. Earlier in this tutorial, we used the negative table and found that the area below negative 1.67 is 0 0.0475. And using the first table with the positive numbers, we found that the area below 1 is 0.8413. So now, to get the probability that z is between negative 1.67 and 1.0, we subtract 0.0475, the piece that's to the left of the negative z, from the whole piece, 0.8413, to get the area in between, which is 0.7938. So 0.7938, or 79.38% of the values, are between a z of minus 1.67 and 1.0, which translates back to x values between 75 and 83. So the probability that x is between a 75 and an 83 is 0.7938. Until now, we have used the table to find areas under the curve for a given x and a corresponding z value. Now let's turn that around, sort of backwards, and ask what is the x or z value given an area under the curve. We can phrase the question as follows. What is the grade value such that 90% of the grades are below this value and 10% of the grades are above? You can see in the figure how this looks. The area below some unknown x or z value is 90% or 0.9, and the area above this unknown number is 10% or 0.10. So how do we find the z or x values when we are given the area under the curve? This is the type of problem I like to call a backwards problem. We solve it using the same technique we have in the past, but work backwards. Here we are given the area under the curve to the left of z, and it's 0.9. So instead of looking across the row and down the column for the intersection of some z value, this time we look in the middle of the table for the closest value to 0.9. Here is a z table we have used for a previous problem. From the accompanying figure, you can see that this table gives the values under the curve to the left of positive z. Now looking in the middle of the table for the closest value to 0.9, we find 0.8997. Now we need to find the corresponding z value by working backwards. Looking to the left, we find the number 1.2, and looking up, we find the corresponding number 0.08. So the closest value for 0.90 is a z value of 1.28. Now the last step is to convert the z value back to the original x value. The formula for doing this is algebraically the same as the original transformation formula to solve for z, but now we are solving for x, so the formula is x is equal to mu plus z times sigma. For our example, x is equal to 80 plus 1.28 times 3, which is 83.84. So 90% of the students got an 83.84 or lower, and 10% got higher. Let's take a look at the original question. What is the grade value such that 90% are below and 10% are above? Working backwards, we found the z value is 1.28, and the corresponding x value is 83.84. 
90 percent of the grades are 83.84 or less in this tutorial we have reviewed the normal distribution curve its characteristics and the way we find probabilities under the curve using the z-table after reviewing this tutorial you should be able to find any area under the curve below any x value above any x value and between any x values you should also be able to find the x value for a given area under the curve i hope you enjoyed this tutorial it contains a lot of important information you will need to continue your studies in statistics it might be worthwhile to review it again enjoy